Guys, you won't believe what I just found. The holy grail of lost media. It's gone! What happened? Oh shoot, the service it was on went under. They really did try everything to save the brand. Streaming services. You have them, you love them, you complain about them. In the age of the internet, it's really a natural progression of how media would be consumed. Why not just queue up your favorite movie or show when your only other option is to become a caveman? Come on. But if all this original content is being made specifically for these platforms with no physical footprint, what would happen if these platforms went under? This has happened more times than you'd expect, so I think it's about high time we take a look at some failed streaming services and laugh at them slash see how it impacts the rest of the industry. Well, let's start off with one that not just failed, but failed to even get off the ground. What type of company do you think of when you hear a new streamer is on the way? Well, entertainment companies make the most sense, but then there are some that want to get in simply because it's another financial hill to conquer. Amazon being a prime example of this. Well, when you take a step back, it may seem odd that they're now a major player in the entertainment field. It also kind of makes sense. They primarily traffic in digital commerce and have more money than God, so it's logical that they would get into this field. But that attracted the green eyes of jealousy from one of their biggest competitors, Walmart. Yeah, in 2018 2019, there were a bunch of rumors that Walmart were gearing up to launch their own streaming service, which apparently would be geared towards middle America, since that's where they have a borderline monopoly on just about all facets of people's lives. Listen, if you've ever been to the Midwest, those guys have nothing to do but go to Walmart. They already did have some experience with streaming, since they acquired Voodoo back in 2010. However, the plans ultimately never materialized, since they just didn't see content production to be an overall worthwhile investment but they didn't throw out these plans completely. They kept the name Walmart Plus, which now acts basically like a traditional Amazon Prime S subscription service where you pay an annual fee to get free shipping and delivery while also getting access to Paramount Plus. So it's basically just Prime except you access a different company streaming service. I guess from a business perspective, I can see why they want to try something like this. With your biggest competitor being Amazon, who in a short amount of time were able to cement themselves as one of the leading streaming platforms, of course you feel as though you can dig into that market. Plus, they were kicking around this idea during a time when the market wasn't flooded and a bunch of other corporations were gearing up to announce their own services. I mean, it's Walmart. They have plenty of rainy day money, I'm sure. I think they just realized they aren't really seen in the same way as Amazon. Walmart, while doing plenty of digital commerce, is first and foremost brick and mortar for most people. It's where you think to go to buy cheap rice, that's how it is for most people. Just because they conduct a lot of their business digitally doesn't mean their market perception would change unless they did some massive overhauls to how they conduct business, which I doubt they have any desire to do. So when it's likely not to succeed in the way they wanted, I doubt they wanted to burn through a bunch of cash even trying. But let's move on to a platform that actually thought it had a chance. One that's existence can totally be justified. That's right, Quibi. I was excited to talk about this one, because when it was around, it was reduced to nothing but a punching bag for the internet. Why? Here, let me show you. Oh boy, I've been waiting all week to watch this new movie. What, what were they thinking? Did they just look at TikTok and other apps while being like, Oh yeah, people will want to watch entire movies and shows like that. This comes off as just a complete misunderstanding of markets. Yes, a large portion of people watch media on their fucking telephone. But that doesn't mean for everyone it's necessarily their preferred option, more so the more convenient one. It's not like you can bring a TV with you on the subway. I've tried. Their gimmick was that their content could potentially either be watched in portrait or landscape, because who doesn't want to return to pan and scan? They were able to drum up attention by having some decent heavy hitters behind them, like Steven Spielberg, who was working on a horror series called Spielberg After Dark for them, which could only be viewable after sunset. Why? See, I think this is what caused its ultimate shutdown. There were just too many weird quirks for people to get on board with. Plus, if you're limiting yourself to just streaming on mobile, then you're automatically putting yourself in a lesser position than your competition. I'm not saying they thought they could be a true competitor to bigger streaming services. However, people are naturally going to see you in the same light as your closest comparison, which is TikTok. A free app with an infinite amount of more content, which is way more interactive. Even at a starting price of 5 bucks a month, most people just couldn't see the value and eventually some of their originals were carted off to other platforms like Roku or YouTube. Nearly 2 billion dollars well spent, guys. Speaking of YouTube, what would you say is the biggest reason for their success? The fact that it's free or widely accessible? That anyone can make stuff for it? 
Well, I did too until I realized it'd be even cooler to start charging them and limit who can add to it. YouTube Red started out as Music Key in 2014 and was essentially a paid service to listen to music on YouTube ad-free, which in concept isn't a bad idea. This was around the time when Spotify and Apple Music were just starting to really blow up, so it's natural that they'd follow the market trends. But then about a year later, they rebranded it to YouTube Red and expanded ad-free to the entire platform. Which again, not a bad idea. Especially when you find out that creators actually make more when someone is subscribed to it. But then they figured it could also open the door to competing with larger streamers. Again, this was 2015, so the few streaming platforms that were around had a near monopoly and YouTube had a built-in viewer base in the billions. Plus, the initial way they went about it wasn't the worst strategy on paper. They made a bunch of movies and shows starring already established YouTubers like Smosh, PewDiePie, Rooster Teeth, and so on. So this could ease their specific fan bases into paying for a subscription, bridging the gap between traditional YouTube and YouTube Red. But the problem started to arise when people started to realize something. None of the originals were good. Like, none of them. If you had high hopes for Smosh's ghost movie, you can throw them out the door. Sad, I know. I think the inherent issue with making content starring YouTubers is that these fan bases were used to getting content from them for free, but then, even if you're offering a higher production value, didn't see much appeal in paying to see them. It's different when a YouTuber makes a movie or something, cause then you're getting a higher production value while also experiencing it in a theater or on a platform that curates a higher quality library. They did have some success with their originals, like how Cobra Kai was started on it before they moved it to Netflix, but they just couldn't get that killer app that the mainstream could latch onto. So ultimately, the platform wasn't able to get the momentum it wanted. Sorta. They never really went under, but scaled way back on their originals, to the point where they hardly even make or advertise them. They rebranded the app as YouTube Premium, with a primary focus on the ad-free aspect, along with some other bells and whistles. So this isn't necessarily a failed streaming service, but the original content aspect largely failed. So I guess this is one of the only instances where they could just salvage what worked while shedding what didn't. See, while researching these platforms, I downloaded something that changed my browser from Google to Yahoo. I'm sure it's fine. So while I have it, why don't we take a look at even their attempts to extract every single ounce of your free time. Back in 2006, when Google acquired YouTube, its biggest competitor was easily Yahoo, who saw the potential in video streaming. So that same year, they launched Yahoo Video as a direct competitor. But eventually, they actually removed the feature to upload videos and just focused on original content, changing their name to Yahoo Screen. Along with being the only free service on this list, they had a fair few series with higher profile names attached to them, like Tom Hanks. Their biggest claim to fame is when they acquired the show Community and gave it one more season. However, aside from that, they were never really able to find that title, which would have people flock to the site. Along with Yahoo as a search engine just naturally becoming less popular, they shut down Yahoo's screen in 2016. But the story doesn't end there. They launched a new platform called Yahoo View. This acted as sort of a successor to the platform, the main difference was this being a paid subscription. I've never seen such an identity crisis. Along with all their original content, they also had a deal with Hulu, where they could stream recent episodes of shows from a number of networks like NBC, ABC, and Fox. But this gained basically no traction, and they shutter their doors in 2019. But I think a good place to end is platforms that didn't exactly fail, but aren't around anymore. See, there's a difference. Take Discovery Plus, for example. Since it's owned by Warner Bros, who also owns Max, they combined the two and jacked up the price a bit. They did the same thing with that DC Universe app. Yeah, having people pay near max prices just to watch like 20 DC movies and shows. It's no wonder why it hardly lasted. They eventually transferred it into being a digital comic book reading app, which I guess is a pretty decent direction to take it. So at least all the content from these apps will be transferred over to a larger one. In this instance. But not all. Here's the problem with having a digital-only future with entertainment. There's no physical footprint to back any of this up. If any streaming service goes under, all of its original content is at risk of potentially being lost with time. And for most of the platforms I've listed, that's the case for a lot of their catalogs. Unless it was something that another platform really wants, it's likely just going to disappear. Plus, since the creators and filmmakers behind them don't typically own the rights to them, it's not like they can upload them to YouTube or wherever. So right now we're in a really awkward and honestly a little scary period where if a platform goes defunct, the future of all of its original content isn't certain. 
we're already witnessing a trend of studios wiping shows and films from existence for purely business reasons. Plus, with physical media sales not being what they used to be, to the point where major retailers just won't be carrying them anymore, the risk of this stuff being completely lost with time is very prevalent. I guess the only thing we can do is just voice the opinion that all media should be preserved and not lost with time for bureaucratic or business reasons. I would say the exact same thing if either Call Me By Your Name or The Oogie Loves was removed from existence. We live in an age where disposable content is more and more prevalent, but the synchronicity of media is just not there like it used to be. It's kind of like how in the zeitgeist the term content is just an umbrella term for all media. It's like how a lot of people see this as content in the same way as this is content. But I guess the best that we can do is just advocate to anyone and everyone that media needs to be preserved regardless of its quality. Most of the time. Everything about it is a pain.